we are very delighted to host this forum because it, it focuses on a, a very, very important topic, a comprehensive forward-thinking plan to address the public transportation infrastructure needs along with a process to ensure diversity among contractors executing this plan will have a long-lasting impact affecting many aspects of this state and its future. We are honored to play our small part in this process by helping to facilitate such a critical discussion. I would like to thank Senator Steve Bradford, a proud alumnus of our university who represents our campus in the 35th Senate District for asking us to co-host this forum with him. His tireless efforts to strengthen this region have made a lasting impression and a lasting impact on the local economy. And he continues to advocate for the families and businesses of this community working to create opportunities for growth and ensuring that there's a level playing field so that all can thrive. I also like to thank and welcome Governor Jerry Brown to our university. Many of you may not be aware of this, but the reason our university is located here where it is today is because his father, Governor Edmund Pat Brown, who relocated this university from Palos Verdes Estates after the 1965 Watts riots. Following the riots, Governor Pat Brown visited this area and determined that access to higher education was one of the ways to combat the inequality that led to the devastation of the Watts riots. Establishing a university in this area became a key element in the plan to revitalize the community. Rancho Dominguez, which is now the great city of Carson, supported our growth and progress. And for more than 50 years, our university, which is one of the most ethnically diverse in the nation, has been cultivating opportunity and success with a quality education that our students take with them upon graduation and use to uplift the surrounding communities. We're extremely proud of this university's social justice mission that continues to serve and reshape this region, helping so many grow and so many prosper. We are thankful to Governor Brown for his forward thinking and courageous leadership, supporting access to affordable, quality higher education in this region and throughout the state of California. For many reasons, our university is the ideal location for this transportation forum. Cal State Dominguez Hills engages both the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. We are located near the Alameda Corridor, surrounded by four major freeways, the 405, the 110, the 710, and the 91, which many of you have experienced getting down here. And we are just south of the second busiest airport in the nation, LAX. As a public university, it is our responsibility to prepare students not just to succeed in the status quo environment, but to thrive in the future economy and have the capacity to lead and change as forward thinkers. We strive to develop academic pathways in line with the region's needs. And I'll give one example. Our partnership with the Los Angeles Harbor College and the Port of Los Angeles gives students a clear pathway to careers in the field of global logistics. As our state continues to flourish, our economic growth and stability depend on an effective transportation infrastructure. I look forward to learning more today about how our business leaders, elected officials, and academic institutions can work together to strengthen our future and communities for now and into the future. Finally, let me make this note. In this library, we have many resources for students, alumni, and members of our community. I extend an open invitation to you to explore the exhibitions, outstanding archives, and special collections that illuminate and illustrate the history of this region. And in the back, we have, quite frankly, one of the nation's best academic archives. Uh, institutions from all over the country come and talk to our folks about how to establish and manage an archive. So again, if you have time, I'd like for you to get out there and visit. So again, thank you for being here now. It is my pleasure. I'd like to introduce California State University Chancellor Timothy P. White. Chancellor White. I'm still going to say a word or so. <laughs> Chancellor White is a champion of inclusive excellence and student achievement. He has worked to strengthen partnerships throughout California's diverse educational, social, political, and economic landscape. He is currently heading up our ambitious system-wide plan, Graduation Initiative 2025, to increase graduation rates, decrease time to degree, and eliminate achievement gaps for all students. Under his leadership, the CSU stands as a national leader in environmental sustainability and diversity of leadership. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Timothy P. White. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Willie, for that kind introduction and opening up your beautiful campus for us today and to the Pro Tem de Leon, to Senator Bradford, to Governor Brown, to Secretary Kelly. Thank you for joining us and so many other elected officials at the local and state and county level. Willie, I'm glad you brought up the history of Cal State University Dominguez Hills and the forward thinking decision of Governor Pat Brown to place the campus here. 
You know, Pat Brown understood the historical and social, the racial and economic threads that weave all Californians together. And he knew six decades ago, he knew that we were only going to be truly successful as a state when every community in the state has an equitable access to opportunity in education and in enterprise, which leads to individual and societal success. And looking forward out to the horizon, setting a future, a vision for the future, then blazing a trail toward that future is really a trait that all Californians share. You know, the American dream is best when coupled with the Californian spirit. And you think about that, it's a spirit that embraces hard work but diversity and education and excellence with a penchant for revolutionary and innovative ideas. Indeed, the Californian spirit is what we need today to solve our transportation challenges. There's no doubt, uh, even getting here from Long Beach myself, that the backlog of transportation infrastructure is massive. It's holding us back from even greater prosperity for individuals and for this community and for equity and for opportunity for all. And at the same time, we shouldn't just go about repairing what we currently have, but building for the economic and social and environmental issues of the future. And I believe that the California State University, with its 23 campuses, it is indeed the most ethnically, racially, income-based, diverse university in the world, with over 470,000 students today and over 3.4 million living alumni, most of whom are here in California. And the CSU is ready to help devise, develop, and test California's next generation transit solutions. You know, we are the engine that produces the engineers, the managers, the accountants, the entrepreneurs, the computer scientists, the global logistics specialists, the environmentalists, scientists, and we also produce more teachers in California than all the other universities combined who teach those professionals who will be integral in the, in, the, in the transportation infrastructure in the years and decades ahead. And our alumni, many of whom are here today, how many actually are alumni from CSU? Just look around. Look at that. Come on, Senator Kelly. <laughs> Secretary, I'm going to raise two hands because I got one from two different places. It just tells you how powerful this university is. And we reflect the true California fabric when it comes to race and ethnicity and age and across the entire income spectrum, just not upper middle and middle and higher. So many low-income students, and so many that are first in their families to venture beyond high school. And our campuses extend 800 miles from the north to the south, and they are prepared with that century's worth of excellence to really help this initiative go forward. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the issues of affordability, keeping costs low, uh, as possible for the university, the community, and the individual student. Accessible, uh, ensuring that transportation options from light rail to shuttles to bike share are available to our students. I'm happy to say that every CSU campus is utilizing many innovative transportation options. And lastly, but most importantly, perhaps, is sustainability and making sure that these projects and partnerships are consistent with our commitments of sustaining this environment going forward. Innovation is a common thread that holds a nexus of affordability, accessibility, and sustainability together. Excuse me. <coughs> that uh, June gloom gets in you sometimes. There we go, it's gone now. <laughs> so think about another campus beyond Dominguez. Cal State LA, just up the road, is tackling the problem of air pollution and traffic by being one of the first universities to partner with LA Metro with heavily discounted TAP cards for students, allowing them to utilize that increasingly extensive light rail and bus systems. Cal State LA is also a global leader in hydrogen fuel cell research and deployment through its groundbreaking H2 station. East Bay, San Francisco, Sacramento, San Diego, Fresno, Chico, the list goes on and on, all leading universities coming up with creative transportation students for their employees and for their students in addition to the research that we just described. And here at Dominguez Hills, six new EV charging stations have been installed with the infrastructure for 14 more 
This campus knows that electric vehicles powered by California's robust solar and wind energy production will continue in transportation and energy future. But at the end of the day, all of these technologies, all these innovations really have a core strength. And that core strength is an educated population. And that is the power and the importance of the California State Universities writ large to produce that educated California. So to the governor, to the secretary, to the pro tem and to the senators, I just want to articulate and commit the CSU is here to research, to innovate, to design, and to work with you to help lead California's transportation infrastructure well into the future. We're ready to go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure as the mayor of Carson to welcome all of you to the great city here. Thank you very much. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize my colleague on the city council, Mr. Councilmember Cedric Hicks. And our elected city treasurer, Monica Cooper, is with us today also. Um, it's uh, my honor and pleasure to introduce um, our senator, uh, to you who's responsible for putting this event together. I'm honored to call him not only our senator, but uh, a friend for over 20 years. Um, senator Bradford was elected to the State Senate in November 2016. Senator Bradford represents the 35th State Senate District, which includes the communities of Compton, Gardena, Harbor Gateway, Hawthorne, Inglewood, Lawndale, North Long Beach, Rancho Dominguez, San Pedro, South LA, Torrance, Watts Willowbrook, Wilmington, and of course, the great city of Carson. Senator Bradford is a lifelong public servant and citizen activist who has spent his career focused on one objective, to represent the communities, neighborhoods, and constituents he is elected to serve. Mr. Bradford previously served as a councilman in the city of Gardena for 12 years and as a member of the state assembly for six. While in the State Assembly, Mr. Bradford chaired the Utilities and Commerce Committee and was pivotal in authoring and passing renewable energy legislation, as well as expanding contract and procurement opportunities for women, minorities, and disabled veterans. Also during his time in the Assembly, Senator Bradford chaired, served as chair of the Select Committee on the Status of Boys and Men of Color. As our elected senator, he is a strong advocate for all the communities and, and pivotally critical in helping secure job and contract opportunities for traditionally underrepresented communities. We don't know what he's going to do as our senator because he's only been there a few months, but I have no doubt based on his track record that we can expect many, many great things from him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our state senator, Steve Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me say welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank, thank Dr. Hagan for opening up this wonderful campus at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Give him a round of applause. And being here today is special for me in many reasons. This is my alma mater. But it was here that kind of like set the seed of my political life. It was here that I met a young man by the name of Mark Dimley, who happened to be the son of Mervyn Dimley, former senator, former congressman, former uh, uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, I know that served with uh, our governor, Jerry Brown, during his first term. And it was here with taking classes when O.W. Wilson, Wilson and uh, and Dr. Fisher that uh, turned on the light for me. So I'm honored to be here today. So again, I wanna thank you for opening up this campus, uh, Chancellor White. I also wanna thank everyone in attendance here today. This is a very special day when we talk about diversity and uh, business, especially as it relates to the state. So I wanna give all of you a round of applause for being here today. So thank you for being here. Just a housekeeping note, This. This uh, event was initially scheduled for the city of Inglewood, and due to some technical uh, 
problems at the last minute. We had to make a quick pivot and come here. So again, I want to recognize the mayor of Inglewood, James Butts, who was working tirelessly to help us pull this together from day one and was kind enough to join us here today and, uh, and meet with the governor about a lot of issues that are pertaining to transportation infrastructure in the city of Inglewood. Uh, I'd like to e introduce someone who is really no stranger to any of us uh, in this room. Uh, he's been on the political scene since a young man uh, when his father was governor, and he has followed his dad uh, and to the governorship, and he even lives in the same home uh, that his father lived in as governor, and in the same governor's mansion, so it's really special. He's a former mayor, former uh, uh, attorney general, former board member on the college board, former secretary of state. He has served on every level of government except for the White House. Uh, <laughs> Governor Brown is known for being a man of great passion on the environment, on climate change, on renewable energy, and in managing the state budget. He is a fiscal hawk. We have just passed a balanced budget seven years in a row because of his leadership, so we thank him for his leadership in that area. He is a very impressive man, I think we would all agree. One thing I know about Governor Brown, if he's committed to an issue, it's more than likely it's gonna get done, so he being here today to talk about diversity is a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. When Governor Brown and the legislative leadership agreed to move forward on a plan to fix our decaying roads and highways and bridges, there was careful consideration of the impact on everyday lives. It's not lost on me every time I go to the gas station and I'm able to fill my tank as I stand in line with people who are scraping change out of their pocket to put as little as $5 into their tank, what this 12 cent a gallon will mean to them. So we were very cognizant of that and the cost of the pocketbooks every day and the savings that we will incur hopefully from improving our roads on vehicle damages and things of that nature and congestion. And while it was a controversial, I think we'll all look back and be glad we will have safer roads and highways. Uh, I asked the governor during a hearing in appropriations and then again in, in a caucus about making sure this investment represented California. We talked about the promise of jobs from the beginning of the negotiations on SB1, and oftentimes we hear about jobs, 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 but then when we look around, we very rarely see people of color, we very rarely see women on these projects, and the governor, to his credit, made a commitment, not only in approach, but again in, in uh, appropriation, I mean, uh, in our caucus, that this is a priority, and I think we can all agree by his presence here today. today. Today we have an agreement that will change the way Caltrans does business. This will develop and implement a plan to increase opportunities for diverse businesses and individuals, not only in the construction, but also in the related services like engineering, communications, media, real estate. The state does billions of dollars a year with contract services, and we wanna make sure those procurement and contract opportunities, again, is as diverse as California. Today, we're holding our first ever meeting on diverse, with diverse representatives to talk with the governor about this issue. But I'm hoping it's more than talk. And again, knowing the governor's commitment, we know it's gonna be more than talk, it's gonna be action. And through this dialogue, we're gonna make positive changes in this community. I'm also honored to introduce, uh, so to that end, I say, I bring forth to you not only our 31st, fourth governor, but our 39th governor as well, Governor Jerry Brown. And as the governor is coming to the stage, I also want to take this moment to introduce all the elected officials, Assemblyman Mike Gibson, who represents the 64th district where we are today, Assemblywoman Autumn Burke in the 62nd district. There are two of the 11 members of the Legislative Black Caucus who were instrumental in having this diversity language entered into the SB1 as trailer bills. So I wanna thank you all for your tireless work and uh, on bringing this to where we are today. Uh, also, I know Mayor Pat Fury from the city of Torrance who also opened up his doors to host this when we 
realized we had to move to my former council colleague from the city of Gardena, uh, Mr. Med uh, Dan Medina, I wanted to say DJ Medina, <laughs> Councilman, <laughs> Councilman Medina, <laughs> the mayor from the city of Lawndale, Robert Pullen Miles, <laughs> Councilwoman from the city of Hartthorne, <laughs> I miss Valentine, I know, I got, <laughs> Miss Valentine. I always call her by her first name. <laughs> Miss Valentine, thank you Councilwoman Valentine for being here from the city of Hartthorne. So I think I've captured all the elective, oh, and Councilman uh, George Dotson from the city of Inglewood. Huh? Yeah, I, and Councilman Cedric Hicks, who was introduced by the mayor, but Councilman Cedric Hicks from the city of Carson, and Councilwoman Emma Sharif, uh, from the city of Compton as well. And the city clerk from the city of Carson as well. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I also wanna uh, bring forth a person who will serve as our MC today. I'm honored to call her a friend, uh, Miss Angela Gibson Shaw. I've known Angela for many years. She's currently the president of the Greater Los Angeles African American Chamber of Commerce and most recently was appointed to the LA County Commission by LA County uh, uh, Supervisor Mark Riley Thomas for Small Business Advisor. Angela is also the current uh, chair of the Los Angeles African American Public Policy Institute, and I'm pleased that she's facilitating uh, this discussion today. And I really want to emphasize Ms. Gibson's stellar uh, work and example of accomplishments before. Uh, Joining Glock, she was a longtime government affairs representative with AT&T, PacBell, SBC, uh, all those different derivatives of uh, our telephone company. And she has worked hard to earn her credit and has served on multiple chambers of commerce throughout the South Bay. So thank you for being here today. And we're also had a special edition added to this program today. And I, I want you to understand, to have the governor here is very special, but also to have our president pro tem, Kevin DeLeon, who helped shepherd SB1 through our house and uh, make sure it got over to the assembly. He has joined us here today for this discussion, so I'm excited about our president pro tem, and I'm gonna bring him up for, for some remarks. Kevin DeLeon, the president of the Senate. Thank you. Good morning to each and every one of you. It's indeed an honor to be here with the governor of the great state of California, as well as your great state senator. That is Mr. Stevie B, Mr. Steve Bradford. Let's give it up for Steve Bradford, right? <laughs> Quite frankly, we're here today because Steve had just mentioned we have incredible mayors here, city council members, as well as entrepreneurs and businessmen and women. We also have the Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Brian Kelly, as well as the Director, Malcolm Dougherty, uh, from Caltrans. And as well, as you mentioned, we have Assemblyman Mike Gibson, the Governor, as well as myself. So I want to give you very special recognition, because Steve is right. During the course of these very difficult negotiations when it comes to SB1, Steve was always very clear from day one. We want to make sure we have inclusivity and we have diversity when it comes to the procurement process, because we will have not hundreds of millions of dollars, we'll have billions of dollars. We have Assemblywoman Burke here as well too, I just saw Assemblywoman Burke too, who was part of this process. We wanna make sure that this is inclusive, because as Steve knows, as Mike, as well as Autumn and others, and myself, and the governor, this was a very difficult vote. It was that, that difficult enough that this issue has not been dealt with for over 25 years because every Democratic as well as Republican legislator, as well as governor, governors of the past, never wanted to deal with this issue. So they kicked that tin can down the pothole ridden road for 25 years. And as a result, our crumbling infrastructure got even worse. Our bridges got less safe, as well as our highways and our local highways and roads. But Steve, Mike, Autumn and others really rose up to the occasion to move forward and I want to put this in scale. For the next 10 years, we'll have more than $50 billion for infrastructure. $50 billion over the course of the next 10 years. This is in perpetuity. Doesn't sunset in 10 years or 15 or 20 years. This is in perpetuity. 
So what Steve had made very clear in the Senate Democratic Caucus is because we'll have so much money, and as a result, economic growth, and the taxpayers, the voters are going to want to see that we can actually deliver, quantify and verify and be accountable for results. Steve wanted to make sure if we're going to have so much money on the table, we want to make sure that's inclusive of all individuals, women, people of color, and not to companies and individuals who are disadvantaged, because no one is disadvantaged, but they are truly underrepresented and they don't have all the same opportunities that others have. So we want to make sure for those men and women who actually secure the contracts, who fill in the potholes, who help build the roads and highways, who actually help build out and retrofit these bridges to make us safer as Californians, that in fact it is inclusive of the reflection of who we are as a great state. A beautiful mosaic, a rich tapestry of every different hue imaginable. It doesn't make a difference your color, your creed, or for which corner of this earth that you're from. Especially during a, a very poignant time in our national body politic. With the tenor at a national level, California, again, is proving to the rest of the nation as well as the world that here in California, the sixth largest economy in the world, we indeed celebrate who we are and we celebrate our diversity. And it has to be reflective also too as part of the economic growth and jobs. So, Steve Bradford, Senator Steve Bradford, my chair of the Labor Committee as well, I want to thank you because you are the one who brought us all here together, your commitment and dedication to the working men and women of California, especially minority businesses, women-owned businesses in California, as you said, should always be reflected in how we go out the procurement process to make sure that we all grow and that we all rise together, not just some. Not just those in Northern Cal, Southern Cal, Central Cal, not just blacks, whites, Latinos, Asian Americans, racially mixed, but all of us together. And that is the promise of a great state and a great nation. With that, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe I was premature in that introduction to the governor, but uh, as I stated, um, I've had opportunity to work with Governor Brown for the last seven years, and this man is truly a visionary. When you talk about a elected official who has touched government on all levels, it's truly uh, exemplified in his work, his understanding, again, as the former mayor of Oakland, as a community college board member, as secretary of state, uh, as attorney general, uh, and again, we're in the position we are today with not only a rainy day fund, but a ro robust uh, budget and savings uh, reserve in the state of California. And we're leading the way on so many important issues from climate change to renewable energy to, again, today, workforce diversity because of his visionary leadership. Without further ado, again, I bring forth to you the 34th and the 39th governor of the state of California, Jerry Brown, Jr. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, all right. All right, thank you. And then we'll sit down. Uh, I think we're going to be sitting down for a little conversation, but I'll be glad to take the podium. Oh, you and the governor's going to be I never turned down a microphone. If, in fact, I have my own microphone here and here, so we're double protected. Anyway, this, this is a very important meeting. I'm glad that uh, such a large crowd of people are here. Uh, we're talking about uh, diversity in construction, uh, diversity in the spending coming out of the recent funding bill for our roads and, and uh, local uh, transportation, uh, as well as bridges. So this, this is part of the larger question of uh, how equal and fair is America. And we know, uh, going back at least 40 years, that instead of getting more unequal, more equal, we're getting more unequal. Uh, the most recent example of that, of course, would be the recent effort, and still pending, uh, to uh, take from the poorest people in America uh, services that are paid for the Medi-Cal program and to take it and give it in tax breaks uh, so that actually 400 families would get from poor, pe poor people services that would be discontinued uh, enough money to fund the Medicaid program in four states. 
So it's almost like uh, just a handful of families are equal to all the people or many of the people that are eligible living in states. So and now I was very glad to see a couple of Republicans said, well, that, that doesn't seem quite right that we take for the poor to give to the rich. You know, when I was growing up, the whole charge was that people want to redistribute wealth. But they were talking about taking it for the rich to give it to everybody else. Now, when they say redistribute wealth, they're talking about taking it from the middle class and the poor and giving it to the top one or two percent. And this has been a phenomenon that's going on uh, decade after decade. We've had Democrats in office. We have Republicans in office. Republicans make it a lot worse. Uh, but the Democrats haven't been able to, to stem the flow either. So we're talking about some concrete things here. Uh, and I want you to know that I'm thoroughly committed to this. I've been, I've been down this road a long time. When I was governor the first time, um, when some of you people were in high school, some of you were in grammar school, and a few of you weren't even born, um, uh, Maxine Waters was not a congresswoman. She was an assemblywoman. And she put several bills in my desk to require certain minority set-asides for contracting. And so then we go do that, and was it enough? And then we get 209, then you get the federal government, you get all the Republicans trying to go the other way. So uh, we have this structure of a globalized economy that is, de that is uh, destroying jobs, and it's really big. We know what happened to factories, you know what's happening to grocery stores. Uh, they're talking about autonomous vehicles. We have hundreds of thousands of truck drivers that could be put out of work. I mean, we're in a revolution of innovation, which is very exciting and which makes life uh, better for a lot of people. But it is destroying jobs. And uh, the economy doesn't always pick up all those jobs. So government is going to have to come in. All these people say government's the problem. That's what they say. Ronald Reagan started that. Clinton kept it up. And even occasionally, I say government's a problem, even though I'm the government. Uh, you figure that one out. Uh, anyway, uh, but we're going to need government to be able to uh, offset uh, this global economy, which is uh, putting jobs in China. I mean, I wanted to buy a little plastic thing for the swimming pool, made in China. I'm going to buy a little this, a little that, a little thermometer. I can't even build a thermometer in California. So there's a lot of work that we've pushed offshore because it's cheaper. OK, everything's cheaper now. But we got a lot of jobs that aren't there anymore. And then on top of that, you have automation. And now they're talking about this something called artificial intelligence. And you can tell that when you can talk. You just, a lot of people now, their only relationship is with their cell phone and with Siri and with all these other. They're constantly talking. And they put it in their ear. And I see people walking down the street. And they're always talking. I say, is this a crazy man? <laughs> no, they're just, he's just on his cell phone, or she's on her cell phone. So we're in a world uh, of revolutionary change. And that revolutionary change is hitting different groups of people differently. And African Americans in particular, as well as other uh, minority groups, uh, Latinos and others that are marked in various ways, uh, are suffering. Many are not suffering, but uh, millions and millions are. So our job is getting tougher. Uh, the response in Washington is getting worse. And so we have to be extra creative. And we have to be creative to get the people in those jobs. And when we talk about minorities, we also ought to talk about people who come out of prison, because they are the most forgotten. I mean, nobody likes them, because they're criminals. And the whole theory today is once you do something, then that's you until you're dead. I don't believe that. I still believe in the idea there's redemption, there's hope. I do want to say that because we are trying to get jobs for people. We are trying to give people a chance to get uh, parole in prison. And people say, no, you can't do that. I wonder, do these are the same people that say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? And if they don't, do that or they don't believe it, they should stop being Christians. They should just say, <laughs> I am an atheistic Republican. <laughs> <laughs> now, hopefully, there are none of those. No, there are a lot of Republicans that are working hard, and I know you, there's a few here. Uh, and that's good. I'm just trying to make a simple point. Number one, the problem, the challenges is big. 
It's not limited to LA, it's global. All over the world, the gap uh, is growing, the stratification, the way the system is working. A few people with computers and, and, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence can be at the commanding heights, and since they're such big, important people, they get all the money, and they're getting huge salaries. And then at the bottom, we try to raise the minimum wage, and people say, well, that hurts business. But it doesn't hurt business when you pay the guy at the top uh, three or 400 times what the guy at the bottom makes. So we're in a very screwed up situation. Let's be clear about that. And instead of, uh, I want you to notice the big picture and the narrow picture is we're gonna do something through this funding and the formulas that have been written with the help of your representatives. Uh, Senator Bradford has helped a lot. We've got the words, now we gotta make it ha happen. Whether it's making the bidding process open and transparent, it's getting pre-apprenticeship, it's using workforce training, all the things we need to do, making sure the minority press gets to be part of the process of dissemination. We're gonna do all the individual things, but all that is in the cause of making a more just society. And to do that, we all have to work at everything we do and uh, really understand uh, the dilemma. Because I have to tell you, things have been, getting, have been getting worse. There are some pockets. California's created a hell of a lot of jobs, uh, 2.4 million. Good, but we still have the problems in the schools, uh, in the job training, and the opportunities. So I'm gonna do everything I can. Um, I've only got a year and a half left unless I run for lieutenant governor. <laughs> or for some other thing. So, but. We want to get it done, and I just, that's my pledge to you, and that's why I came here, uh, because uh, I, I, I want to hear from you, I want to see uh, your faces, and know this is something real. This is human, it's not about bureaucracy. It is about bureaucracy, but not alone. And the only way we can get the, the, the zeal and the uh, energy and commitment to, to move aside this tremendous weighty force of inequality is that we do everything we can and together, and I promise you, Caltrans will do everything it can. Anything it can't get done, we'll move Caltrans out of the way, and the bosses are right here, all right? They all serve in my pleasure. I can snap my fingers and fire them before I finish. No, that's true, and they know that. So guys, deliver. Thank you. I think it's all been said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fire Tim White, though. He works for the trustees. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing on this beautiful Friday right before the 4th of July holiday? Appreciate y'all coming out. We're going to have a little conversation here, set the tone and the context. Today's roundtable, we've got the folks here that are going to put the meat on the bones. But we want to spend a few minutes and talk about it in context, about what this is. When I look around in the audience, I see uh, chambers of commerce. I see uh, fellow business members. I see small profit uh, organizations. I see community leaders, business leaders. And so, Senator, when you call, they came. This is a very momentous announcement, a big, big project. And so just to set this uh, day in context, I guess, if you will, what is the purpose for, for this round table this afternoon, this morning that we're about to embark on? Well, no, I want to hear you. Uh, I, I think the governor touched upon it, but as I stated in my open remarks, it's about bringing diverse enterprises together and talk about real opportunities, but not just to talk about it. We're going to put some meat on the bones as we move forward on how we include small, women-owned, minority-owned, disabled veteran-owned businesses and give them a piece of this pie of this infrastructure work that's to be done, as our pro tem said, into perpetuity. Uh, we often say it's a $52 billion, but it has no sunset on this legislation. So we want to make sure that the workforce is as diverse as California. But we also want to make sure that those obstacles that we've heard far too long about that impediments for small businesses to do work with California or even in the private sector are removed, or at least we kind of like smooth the pathway a little bit. And those are the challenges because I look around this room prior to 
me uh, joining the Senate, I chaired Utilities and Commerce, and we had these discussions about diversity and GL 156 spending, and how do we include more women-owned, minority-owned, disabled-owned veteran businesses and bring them to the table. And I'm happy to report from the time I was in assembly in 2010 to now, we've gone from a $4 billion spend to over $9 billion spend that's gonna be done with women and minority businesses. I'm a firm believer if we can do it in the utility sphere, we can do it in the governmental sector and the government sector as well. Well, and uh, that's what we're here today to understand what some of those challenges are, but also share with you the opportunities. And again, the day is not just about a dialogue, it's about some con constructive measures and how we move forward to make this real and make sure that this represents and benefits all of Californians. Great. Governor, would you like to? Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I tried to say uh, in my opening that we're facing uh, not a narrow problem, but a global problem, and a problem that's been going on for decades. So we're making progress, but when you look at the big picture, the gap uh, is not reversing. Uh, I don't know whether it's still growing. I think it is still growing. And how do you change that? Because these are big global market forces that transcend America. They're, they're uh, all over the world. And we have certain attitudes that are very uh, counterproductive. Uh, there are people, for example, who, who didn't like this bill because it required money. And there are other people, there are people who say, well, look, we fix our roads, but don't ask me for any money. And it's pretty, and that attitude reaches all the way to the White House. The White House is talking about infrastructure, but if you say raise a tax to pay for it, like Eisenhower did and Reagan did and other people, uh, like my father did, uh, no, they don't want to do that. And so here's America. Uh, they're supposed to be the superpower of the whole world. We've got military bases in over 700 uh, different places throughout the world. And watch this. We can't build our own roads, and we can't help anybody else build their roads. Well, there's another country called China. Not only are they building their roads, just this week opened two more high-speed rail systems. They're building trains in Africa. They're building roads in Kazakhstan. So they're not afraid to raise taxes. They're not afraid to fix their own roads. They're fixing everybody else's. So that sounds like a superpower to me. Now, if you're going to say, oh, we can't afford, we can't raise that tax, we can't fix our roads, don't talk to me about your roads. So the, the core, pro one first problem is that we have a lot of people who don't recognize reality. Roads are not free. It costs money. I mean, this is real money here. And, we got, and some people say, no, we don't need it. Well, they don't need it because they're so damn rich. Uh, they can, you know, hide out in their own private roads, I suppose, or uh, take jet planes or do something. So that's the world we're in. So why are we here? We're here to wake ourselves up, send the message out that we're going to change all that. And we're tired of it. And then, of course, while we're... So first of all, we got to get over the fact that we do got the money. We got five billion, you know, for well, for a, until somebody repeals it. So it'll, it'll, and don't say that somebody won't. I'm sure there's somebody going to run for governor. In fact, there is some guy. He says, "Elect me, and you can drive on your own dirt roads <laughs> or gravel roads. Maybe we can get an upgrade." And that's where he goes. But they won't tell you that because they think there's somebody called the Tooth Fairy that will supply all the money that people don't want to put up for. <laughs> so, okay, we got to get the point that our collective institution is the public sector, is Caltrans, is the government, and the legislature, and the Congress, and so we want to work in a positive way, not all negative. And then secondly, if you can get over that hurdle, which we're not over yet, although we are in California, if we get over that hurdle, then we got to divide up the pie fairly. And it's not divided fairly. It is not divided fairly. The top 0.1% has as much as the bottom 40%. So that means if you take 300 million people, that's 120 million people, they're about equal to whatever 1% of 300 million. What's that? It's like 3 million or something? Or 300,000. So figure that out. I didn't take college math. But the, the point is that it's, it's really bad. So I know politicians are supposed to tell you how good it is. Well, under me, it's pretty good. <laughs> but it's still not right. 
and it's still unfair, and there's still a lot of inequality, and it isn't going away unless we do something different than what we've been doing. So that's my commitment. We're going to do something different in this next year the best we can, and then you know, we'll see how far it goes. But it's going to take you to keep the heat on and to keep pressuring and keep waking this country up while we can wake up because you know, it's not at all clear that we're going to make it with that character tweeting all night. I mean, that's, that's pretty scary. All right. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I, I think you have more, and we'll get to that. <laughs> Uh, um, Senator, let me ask you this. This is a $52.4 billion project, this SB1. So please take a minute and talk about the importance of transportation diversity at this time. I, I think it's critical. Uh, and I think it's not missed on any of us as we drive along the highways and roads uh, along California, the, the, the need for repair. We have over 500 bridges and overpasses that are in uh, desperate need of repair. We can name communities within a mile radius of here whose streets are ridden with potholes, and all of that needs to be addressed. Uh, the mayor of Inglewood, they're spending $33 million improving Century Boulevard because it's not a single one of us who is not driven to the airport along, along uh, Century Boulevard and has not complained about the conditions of those roads. So it's clear that the roads and infrastructure need to be repaired. As the governor stated, it's been neglected for years and now we're tackling this issue. But again, we wanna make sure that the opportunity for all Californians to do business is, is available here. And I just wanna take it in context. If we're gonna spend five billion dollars a year. Just if 10% of that went to minority, women-owned, or disabled veteran-owned businesses, do you understand the impact to those businesses? That's $500 million a year that these businesses could do. So say if you had 100 businesses there, there's $5 million to their bottom line. And if you had 500 businesses, that's a million dollars to the bottom line. So these small, own businesses, this is a critical uh, uh, deal to them. It's a great opportunity, but also we want to make sure, uh, so often it's the narrative that we have to train businesses to do work uh, with governmental entities or private fact, uh, uh, sectors. That's the farthest thing from the truth, because as I look around this room, there's engineers in this room, there are uh, heavy equipment owners in this room, uh, there's architects, and uh, People know how to get the work done. It's just about having an opportunity to do the work. So this transportation infrastructure is critically important. Again, the Legislative Black Caucus was key in making sure that we put language in here that guaranteed that Caltrans would really look at diversity here uh, and not violating 209 in any kind of way. And in many ways, Caltrans is exempt through much of the federal dollars that they get, but through, this is a tax on, on the state. We still want to make sure that we're in line. And they have set a ceiling of 25%. Mm. So I'm seeing if we just got 10% of that pie. So imagine what 25% of that pie uh, would mean. And we also want to talk about workforce development. So I'm uh, happy that we have uh, South Bay WIP mm -hmm. here because this is going to be uh, the vehicle that helped train some of these people, as the governor said, ex-offenders who have a skill set but never given the opportunity to work. We want to train these young men and women and make sure that they are welcomed back into society and, and allowed to make a decent living, to put a roof over their head, send their kids to college. And uh, this is what it's all about, and I think it's enough here that everyone here can win. And again, we've set a 25% goal, but I'm seeing even if 10% of that was spent with women-owned, minority-owned, or disabled-owned uh, businesses, it would have a tremendous impact on uh, those businesses, the economy, and our communities. Governor? Uh, well, look, we've outlined the goal. We've got a 25% goal. Uh, we have a number of groups that uh, are disadvantaged, and now we just gotta make sure uh, that we get it done. And I'm very, so this is the more mechanical, actual, specific, uh, day after day work that Caltrans and, and others, uh, utilities have to be doing as well. But in addition to that, I, I still wanna say that our education has to be oriented uh, toward career as well. 
And a lot of these kids are sitting in school and they're not getting the acquaintanceship uh, with the kind of skills and attitudes that it takes uh, to do uh, to work in some of these businesses. So we got to work at every every angle, uh, and it's a, but it's doable, and we know what to do. And I think this uh, meeting here is an occasion to recommit ourselves to a more intensive uh, effort at diversity, at fairness, and reaching out in very transparent ways to all the communities that constitute uh, the great diversity of California. Great. I agree. This is uh, really going to be a game changer, this project. Uh, let's talk about maybe some of the obstacles that we're going to have to overcome and what success will look like. Let's start with the small business diverse communities. What are some of the obstacles that they're going to face, that they're going to need to overcome? Senator? So often we hear about bonding. How do we get bonding for these projects? So those are the things that we want to talk about. Uh, and our pre-meeting with the governor, uh, we had Ms. Wilson even talking about as we set up the early foundation of what this looks like to make sure that there are diverse people at the table as we start to build the framework of how do we move forward to include uh, diverse businesses at the table. Many times, uh, by time they hear about it, it's too late. So we want to make right. sure that we work with our electronic and print media to get the word out that these opportunities are available and that you know, even training, as we stated, we, we, we make sure that there's proper training for those who do need training. So uh, it's, it's a, a lot of moving parts. And as I stated today, it's just the beginning. And I'm hoping we're going to have not just more dialogues, but more constructive meetings on how we build this, how we move forward, what does success look like uh, as we move forward down the road on this issue. Well, Caltrans has its own... Uh uh, web pages that uh, help identify uh, what opportunities are available uh, at the subcontractor, general contractor level. Uh, the cities have, uh, are not part of Caltrans, but they, uh, they can do uh, similar things. So you got to get the word out, and then you have to measure where you're going. We got an inspector general that will be providing some audit of what's going on. We have data and information to collect, report to the legislature. Those are all opportunities. The thing that I have to keep repeating, Whatever is didn't get here overnight. It's part of a body politic that is wired together uh, by the historic forces that have brought us to where we are. So unwinding that uh, takes heroic effort, takes insight, uh, takes a lot of political mobilization, and uh, I think it takes your keeping, keeping watch on how we do but you're gonna get the tools because we have the data, we have the goals, uh, we have the processes, and uh, I can promise you we're gonna be active in engaging all the relevant stakeholders in making this process as fair as it humanly can be. Thank you, I think you touched upon my next question. As I said, we've got experts here in the audience from all uh, walks of business and employment, and so what can they do to help to make sure that uh, the success for SB1 and the diverse communities are realized. Stay engaged for sh sure. And uh, meeting with us, uh, meeting with Caltrans, uh, I, 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 and I look around this room and I, I know many of you said we've been doing this because I see many that have attended the Ombak hearings with the PUC as it uh, deals with supplier diversity. And I often hear from small businesses, I take time out of my day, I come to these meetings, and at the end of the day, it doesn't result in anything. But you have to be dil diligent. You just can't show up today. You have to be willing to come to those off-site small meetings where the governor's not there and add your voice, add your expertise, and under, let us understand, especially large governmental entities, where those roadblocks are, how do you need assistance? But we also have to work with our state departments in making sure that the model that you've been using for the last 30, 40, 50 years doesn't work today. And, you know, and we know about the old boy next network of, you know, we've been doing it like this for so long, that paradigm has to change. So I just say be vigilant vil and uh, about meeting with us, being determined to let us know what's important to you, what your skill set is, especially. Many times I meet with a lot of small businesses. Well, I want to do business with the government. I want to do business with the utilities. And I said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. Understand what you bring to the table. If you're an engineer, 
let us know. You know how to build bridges and roads. You know, if you're an architect, let us know that. I mean, even real estate acquisition is probably going to be part of this as we acquire property to build new roads and things of that nature, easements, things of that nature where your skill set will be needed. The media will be needed as well. So uh, I just think continuing to not only meet with me, but the, the various departments who are going to be uh, working to be a part of these chambers as well and these various incubators that probably will be set up to help move this project forward. Meeting with your local elected officials, like the mayor of Torrance, the mayor of Carson, because they too will have their own infrastructure projects and understanding what those projects are, what the need is, and understanding I have a skill set and making these local elected officials aware because they're going to be in charge of their own projects. They're going to be projects outside of Caltrans that local governments are going to determine and they're going to do their own hiring. So making sure that mayors and city council people in the city know who you are. Governor, how can we help yeah, you be successful? Well, you know, a lot of these are subcontractors. So you got to know who they are. You got to get into that process mm -hmm. at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, as you said, I'm not going to be at these other meetings. Uh, but you do have local representatives, uh, legislators, and they don't have to spend all their time making new bills. You know, they can be out there helping you. They can be your ombudsman. That's what I like to see. Do more of that. Get out in the community. Listen to them. And don't, don't give me all those damn bills. <laughs> I'm out of the community. <laughs> Although I signed all yours. Exactly. So <laughs> I got a whole lot more coming your way. So, uh. <laughs> so we need, look, the, the, the legislator is a bridge. The assembly person or the senator, their staff, and then they get on Caltrans. And we, we just have to all interact together and be as responsive as we can. If something isn't right, you've got to get that message out, and it'll get to where it has to go. But we're committed. Uh, it's from the top down. Uh, we want to work for you. We want to make it work. And so does Bradford, and so does uh, Senator DeLeon. So we're here for you, and now you do your part. We're going to do our part. And I would also say, make sure you get your certifications, that what you need. A lot of times... Again, I've met with a lot of them, and I said, have you done this? No. Have you gotten your MBE or WBE? No. I said, those things help, because we've seen it in the utility spin that there now is a, a portal for the PUC clearinghouse. And if you're a minority, woman-owned business, you're listed on that uh, clearinghouse website if you're qualified. So make sure you're qualified. Uh, to do this type of work. If you fall under minority business enterprise, make sure you have those certifications. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, Senator, Governor, for thank taking you. the time. We're going to talk to the people that are going to help us put some meat on the bones. But any final comments that you'd like to make? Let me just say that I appreciate the opportunity to host this at GLAC, our African American Chamber of Commerce. We focus on education access and advocacy. And so I appreciate that you've uh, discussed some of the opportunities, some of the obstacles, and we're going to be looking for you to provide the resources to help us get to that place and make this a successful project. So again, I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Final comments. No, I've said enough. No. <laughs> I, I would just want to <laughs> echo again how unprecedented this, this meeting is today and having the governor here. and. What a tough vote this was for all the members who cast a vote for Mike Gibson, for Assemblywoman Burke. This was not an easy vote for us because we've heard over the last two months from our constituents who are complaining and seeing, you know, the th uh, 12 cent impact and what that means to them in filling up their cars. So much so that one of my colleagues in the Senate is now a target of the recall. Josh Newman from Orange County is now being recalled simply because he cast this vote. So we need you to know how courageous your members were to, to do this, the leadership of the governor. So it's imperative that we make this work. Uh, you hold our feet to the fire. As the governor says, there's going to be an inspector uh, general involved to make sure that benchmarks are met. But we need you guys to have our backs, too, the business community, to understand this is important because we all use the roads. Whether we drive, we use public transportation, Uber, Lyft, you name it, 
we need to have quality roads in order to keep California moving, keep our economy growing, and this is an important uh, vote because of the neglect that we've seen as our pro team said, we had kicked the can down the pothole road for for uh, last 25 years. So uh, I just want you to know the significance of this measure and the impact that it will have in California and the role that you can play if you let your voices be heard and be vigilant and active. And as the governor says, come to us. Let us know what those challenges are, but at the same time, understand, don't get mad at your elected officials because we needed to take this vote or you'd be driving down the street because the average consumer who drives faces somewhere around $700 in car repairs mm. every year because of our road conditions. So we're making our roads safer, we're making them uh, more accessible, and, uh, and at the same time, we really wanna create jobs for all Californians. So again, I wanna thank you for all being here and taking out your time. You're gonna have a great discussion with uh, Caltrans and uh, Secretary Kelly as we move forward. Also wanna recognize again our pro tem for being here, Kevin DeLeon, for your leadership. <laughs> for Assemblyman Gibson, Assemblywoman Burke, but more importantly for our governor and uh, his visionary leadership to uh, get SB1 passed, but more importantly to show you uh, small business folks his commitment to diversity here in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you.